I'm going to hand you over to Jess. Cool. Hi. All right. So imagine this. You're walking down the street in the city in the evening, and uh, you're sending a message on your phone. And because you're distracted, you don't realize that there's a step coming up, and you trip over, and you break your arm. So that's six weeks in a cast. Uh, to make matters worse, it's your dominant arm. So there's a good chance that your job and income rely on you being able to use a computer. Uh, and so, sorry, I just realized I don't have my slide notes. So let's get at this. Because there's no way I could do this whole thing without my notes. <laughs> Go again. Okay, great. Take two. All right. So you've got a broken arm, but you can do everything that you normally do just with a keyboard instead of a mouse, right? Maybe uh, if the things that you want to use have considered accessibility. Uh, if not, it's going to be a long six weeks. So hi, I'm Jess. I'm a front-end developer, an accessibility consultant, and I also work as a digital producer at HBF. I'm based in Perth. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you guys about uh, making single page applications more accessible. And so I was going to ask, you know, what's the ratio between Vue and React? But Michael's done that for me. Uh, and so it's actually good. Oh my gosh. Yes, okay, that is the right side. Don't mind me. Sorry, first time speaker. Um, okay, so. It's okay if you use React or Vue because pretty much everything I'm going to talk about is applicable to both. Um, so and I'll, be mentioned, I'll be talking about both of them throughout. So every so often there's a vocal outcry about uh, how bad JavaScript libraries are for accessibility. And I can see why people would think that. A lot of websites that are created with JavaScript libraries are in fact pretty inaccessible. But they don't have to be. There's nothing inherent in React or Vue that make them inaccessible to people with disabilities. It's just that we as developers don't always know what needs to be managed or considered to make our apps more inclusive. Uh, and so my goal today is to give you some simple quick wins um, on accessibility uh, and to show you that improving the accessibility of your websites is probably easier than what you think it is. Uh, so, what are we talking about when we say web accessibility? Uh, essentially, we're talking about removing the barriers that prevent people with disabilities from using our websites and apps. So, make it easier for these people to consume our content and complete the actions that they came to do. If you had to guess, how many people in Australia would you think have a disability? It's one in five. So that might be surprising to some of you, um, because a lot of disabilities aren't obvious to others. Uh, the majority are actually invisible. So 300, over 357,000 Australians have a visual impairment of some kind. So uh, you might first think of people with blindness, but there's a range of low vision um, impairments that can affect how a person might use your website. Uh, so one in six Australians are affected by hearing loss. Uh, my sister-in-law is uh, completely deaf in one ear. She wasn't born with a hearing impairment. Um, last year, she got a really bad ear infection, and a tragic side effect of that was that she completely lost her hearing permanently. Um, so she's really glad that there's a trend to include captions on Netflix and on all our social media posts lately. Some other types of disabilities that uh, we need to consider are mobility and motor impairments, cognitive learning, and intellectual impairments. Uh, so we do usually discuss web accessibility in terms of people with disabilities, but I think it's important to understand that focusing on accessibility improves the experience for everyone. Many things we take for granted were originally designed and developed for people with disabilities, uh, so the modern potato peeler is an example. Um, this was designed for people with arthritis. Uh, SMS was developed to help the deaf communicate. 
and predictive text, which I'm sure a lot of us use every day. Um, this was developed to assist people with mobility impairments. When we design and develop our products with accessibility in mind, everyone benefits, including ourselves if we're unable to use a mouse, if our vision gets blurred from an eye infection, or if we're just on the train uh, and we've forgotten our headphones. Accessibility in the web is really broad, um, but today I just want to focus on the areas that developers have control over and the things that are going to give us our biggest bang for our buck. Uh, most of the issues with um, JavaScript frameworks affect keyboard users and screen reader users. Um, has it, put your hand up if you've heard of screen reader. Yep, a lot of people, excellent. Put your hand up again if you've ever used a screen reader. Tested it out. Yeah, just for testing. Yeah, okay, so much less of us. That's cool, as long as you know what it is. Uh, so you may wonder why a person that um, doesn't use a screen reader, so they've got vision, might be using only the keyboard. So um, a few examples are repetitive strain injury or chronic pain conditions. They might find it painful to use a mouse. Uh, people with motor impairments such as Parkinson's disease, um, they might not have the dexterity required to use a mouse accurately. Um, and then there's people who just don't have um, mobility in their arms at all. They can use other types of pointing devices to use the keyboard. Uh, and in the same vein, not all screen reader users are blind. Um, people with dyslexia and ADHD sometimes prefer to use a screen reader because they have difficulty passing the words themselves. So the things we're going to talk about today is going to help in all of these situations. So we're going to start with um, semantic HTML because this is really the foundation of an accessible website. Semantic HTML means using the native browser elements and controls to convey the meaning, structure, and purpose of our content. To understand why semantic HTML is so important, it's helpful to understand how people using screen readers navigate web pages. So just as sighted users can scan a web page to get the information as quickly as possible, screen reader users do the same thing. So what screen readers often do is create a list of the different types of elements. So a list of all the headings on a page, all the links, all the buttons, all the roles, and then they navigate between them. But they can only do this if we've used the correct semantic markup. If we've used divs and spans, we've actually removed their ability to create these lists and navigate effectively. So here's an example card component. Um, just a quick note, if this was JSX, um, class would become class name because class is a reserved word in JavaScript. But I'm sure we've all seen markup like this before. We've got uh, a wrapper div, uh, a heading div, a paragraph div, a button div. This is what we affectionately call div soup. So divs don't actually mean anything. Um, so they don't pass any contextual information to the accessibility tree. So instead of using divs and spans, we can make better use of HTML by using the semantic markup. So here we've got an example of a more accessible card component. We've used a list item for the wrapper. Um, so a screen reader user will be able to hear how many items in this list of things that we have. Um, a heading so that people can navigate, paragraph, and a real button. Uh, and I just want to point out that there's actually SEO benefits for using semantic markup. Um, so a screen reader is a machine, just like Google crawlers are. And if a screen reader doesn't understand your content, there's a good chance Google doesn't either. Uh, but let's go back to this button for a sec. Native HTML buttons are actually really amazing. So by default, they're focusable by the keyboard. They can submit data to a server. They can reset forms. They can be disabled with the disabled attribute, uh, and they include the button role implicitly. Let's take a look at what we would need to do to make our div button accessible. First, we'll need to make it focusable with the keyboard because divs aren't focusable by default. So we'll give it a tab index of zero. Uh, next, we'll need to give it a role of button. So this lets the screen reader user know what the purpose of this element is. Uh, so without this, a screen reader user could assume that this is just plain text and it's not something that's meant to be interacted with. 
Uh, and then we'll need to give it a key up or key down handler. And this is because divs don't have the same synthetic click activation that's built into a button. Uh, and so if we don't add this, uh, the keyboard won't be able to activate the, the button at all. <coughs> so we could do all this, or we could use a button and get all that behavior built in for free. So next time you need to an element to do something, so like triggering a pop-up menu, opening a modal window, toggling an interface, then a button is the right choice. We also need to ensure that our components are rendering um, HTML that's valid. A common um, pattern is for a component to return a list of children. Uh, but the issue is that components can only have one single child element. So if we tried to do something like this uh, and return two child elements, we'll get a compilation or a runtime error. So uh, the way that developers have gotten around this is by wrapping it in a div. But this can cause several issues, partially with styling, um, but also because um, for some particular elements like lists, tables, things like that, um, it's actually invalid to have um, something in between the parent and the child. So in React 16.2, uh, fragments were introduced, and essentially you just replace that wrapper div with a React fragment. And then at build time, when the JSX is transpiled, uh, it's not rendered out. So this allows us to group a list of children without adding unnecessary nodes to the DOM. Uh, unfortunately, Vue doesn't have fragments yet, but it is on the roadmap for uh, Vue 3, so it's coming soon. Uh, in the meantime, there is also an NPM plugin called Vue Fragment, which does the same thing as React Fragments. Uh, so next we're going to talk about forms, everybody's favourite thing. Uh, and we want to talk about how uh, all inputs require a label of some kind. And these need to be linked programmatically. Uh, so in this example, we've got um, a label which is for sighted people, but it's actually not linked to its input. So when a screen reader uh, user enters the input, it will hear edit text, but it won't have the label announced to it. So they won't know what this text area is actually for. So to fix this, what we're going to do is just add an ID onto an input, a unique ID, and then reference this on our label with the for attribute. So now when a screen reader user goes onto this, they will have the label announced to them first. So it will be dog breed edit text. It's now clear what this label, what this input is requiring. Uh, just to note that if this was in JSX, HTML, uh, sorry, for would become HTML4, and that's because for is a reserved word in JavaScript. So what if you can't set the ID in advance? This is pretty common in a single page application because you don't know how many times the component's going to load. And if it loads three times, they're not unique IDs anymore. So a way to get around this uh, is to wrap our input inside the label. This will implicitly link them. And you might think, well, Jess, that's way easier. Why didn't you say that first? We'd just do that, right? Um, unfortunately, it doesn't have as good support with assistive technologies as explicitly linking them. So if you can, explicitly is better, but if you can't, this is a good alternative. But Jess, what if the design doesn't have labels? This happens, because designers like to be minimalist. I get it. Um, there we go, yeah. Uh, so then what we can do is um, we can add a label and hide it with CSS. I uh, don't know how many people might be using Bootstrap, but they've got a class called SR only, which means screen reader only, and that's going to hide it in an accessible way. If you're not using um, something like Bootstrap, you can roll your own. Um, there's great articles online, and I'll link to one in my slide notes on how to hide content accessibly, so just for screen readers. And I just wanted to quickly mention um, an extra benefit of linking these. Uh, essentially, it increases your hit area or touch target. So a user can click anywhere on the label and it activates the input. This is particularly helpful with checkboxes and radio buttons. Uh, it's particularly beneficial for people with mo mobility impairments. 
Um, but it's also, this is a way better experience for everybody. Uh, so the next thing we want to ensure that we're doing is updating the page titles. Typically with a single page application, we'll set the title once in the global template and then we'll just leave it and forget about it. Uh, and just to be clear, we're not talking about the uh, page title within the content of the page. We're talking about the document meta title that shows in the browser tab. Uh, this is the first piece of information that's announced by a screen reader when the page loads. Um, and it gives context about what page we're on. And it also acts as confirmation of a context change for screen reader users. So how do we update the document page title when the page isn't really changing? We're going to use um, a React lifecycle method called component did mount. Uh, this is the same as the mounted hook in view. And it just executes the code inside of it when it loads on a page. Uh, and then we're just going to use vanilla JavaScript doc document.title. Um, and then so when the page, when this component loads, uh, the page title will be updated to this value. So this is helpful for screen reader users. Um, it's also helpful for people with cognitive disabilities. And it's also just helpful for you and me when, if we have lots of tabs open. I don't know if I'm the only person who does that. Uh, so next we're going to talk about voc visible focus styles. These help sighted users know where on the page they are. So default browser, sorry, each browser has its own default styles. Um, you've probably seen like a blue outline ring around things before. And these tend to be removed for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, designers and developers have been removing these. Uh, designers don't like them because they're off brand and they're also perceived as ugly. Um, but that's a bit like removing a wheelchair ramp from a school because you don't like the look of it. When we remove these focus indicators, keyboard users get lost. It's a really confusing experience because there's no way to know where on the page you are. So if you hit enter, you could go anywhere. Who knows? So instead of removing these styles entirely, uh, there is a middle ground where can we can replace these styles with our own on-brand styling. Um, so an easy way to do this if you don't want to come up with, you know, particular just focus styles is to extend your hover state styles. Um, I often do this because I'm not a designer first. Um, it does the job. Uh, so our next topic um, is probably one of the biggest ticket accessibility items that we see, not just in single page frameworks, but just generally. Um, and that's managing the user's focus. So single page applications have silent routing, which prevents the browser from refreshing. Um, but to see why this is a problem, um, I want to show you what a screen reader user would typically experience on a website that doesn't have client-side rendering. Now let's make sure I have sound on. Why everyone should own a dog. Link list four items. Caring for your dog. Link list four items. Dogs are the best. Link list four items. Dogs are the best. You are currently on a tab. In skip to main content. So I'll just reiterate what's happening here. Um, so we're navigating link to link through the tab button. Uh, we find a link that we want to follow, so we activate it with the enter key. Um, and then the page refreshes. Our keyboard focus is kicked to the top of the page, and the new unique page title is announced. So contrast that with a single page application. Um, so then we would click through our links, click the one that we want, and the page would visually change, but the title doesn't get updated or announced, um, and the keyboard focus is generally just dropped to the next thing. So that's usually the footer. So it's not a good experience for a screen reader user or a sighted keyboard user. So what we want to do is just recreate some of that traditional browser behavior. Uh, so there's two sort of options here. We could move content to the top of the page, which is what would normally happen, um, or we can move focus to the new content. Uh, the Gatsby JS team recently did some user testing uh, with people with a range of disabilities, um, and they found that moving focus to the new content was the most intuitive. So that's the example that I'm going to use today. 
Uh, and before we go into that, I just really want to quickly cover um, a topic that sometimes gets a little bit confusing for people, um, and that's tab index. Uh, so there's three possible things that we can do. Um, tab index of a zero um, takes an element that wasn't normally focusable or tabbable, and it inserts it into the normal tab or DOM order. Uh, so tab index of negative one takes an element that is potentially um, it could be focusable or not focusable by default, but you're making it, you're taking it out of the tab order, so people can't tab to it anymore, but we can send focus to it with JavaScript. Uh, and there is one other um, option, which is a positive integer. Um, there's not really any time that you would need to do this. Um, it's generally considered an anti-pattern to avoid, um, but what it does is it um, explicitly says, this is the order that I want things to tab for the whole page. And then you have to manage every single um, tabbable thing. So just mentioning it for completeness, but don't do it. Um, and just for JSX, um, tab index becomes camel case. So for focus, we're going to use refs. Um, so this is something that's in Vue and React. Um, and it essentially just allows us to select an element and send focus to it. So three steps involved in that. Um, the first is that we'll just create it with react.createRef. Uh, we're going to add it to our whatever we want to send focus to. Um, notice that I've just put a tab index of minus one because headings aren't um, tabbable by default, but we want to be able to send focus to it. Um, and then just vanilla JavaScript um, focus method um, inside of a component did mount method. Um, and we can use that in conjunction uh, with the document to the title, so we can update the title and send focus at the same time. So by doing this, we've helped sighted keyboard users navigate more effectively, and we've alerted the screen reader users to the context change. Uh, next, I just want to talk about some tools and some testing tips. Uh, ESLint Alley plugins. So there is one for Vue, and there is one for uh, JSX, and this just lives inside your IDE. Uh, and it's going to give you accessibility tips um, right inside your template. So it checks for things like, do all your images have alt attributes? Do your mouse events have corresponding key events? Uh, do all your anchors have accessible content inside them? Um, and this will just print out into your console. And so this tool is really helpful to check um, the accessibility issues inside our template, but it's not able to test any of the rendered output. So that's when a library like Axe Core comes in. Um, this is available as um, React Axe or Vue Axe. Um, and so again, this tests your rendered output um, and it sends messages to the console and it'll give you severity warnings. So it will um, help you decide which things you really need to look at as a priority. Uh, Google Lighthouse um, is a suite of editing tools right inside Chrome DevTools in the Audits tab. Um, it'll give you a score out of 100, and then you can just see which tests have passed and which have failed. Uh, Accessibility Insights is my new favorite browser extension for accessibility. The error messaging is really easy to understand, um, and it's really easy to use. Um, it's an open source tool released by Microsoft, and it's available for Edge and Chrome. Uh, and both Google Lighthouse and Accessibility Insights are both powered by Axe Core under the hood. They just run a custom set of rules. Uh, and so wrapping up on the tools, I just wanted to quickly tell you about a really great article I saw earlier this year. Um, so what the author did is he wanted to get the highest accessibility rating score with the least accessible website he could make. I don't know if anyone has seen this. <laughs> um, but essentially, he got 100% accessibility score from um, Lighthouse. Uh, and what he had was a blank page. So screen reader users couldn't see it. Um, people with full vision, nothing there. Um, but he also, he was very clever. Um, if you view sourced, that was all like weird numbers and letters and things like that. So you couldn't even cheat, like literally nobody could access the content on this website. But he was still able to pass all of the tests. And so you might think the moral of the story is that automated testing tools suck, but it's not. Uh, it's just that it's the first step. Um, it can pick up 20 to 30% of your issues, um, but you really do need to do some manual testing if you care about accessibility. 
And the good news is it's not that hard. Um, everyone here can do it. The easiest one is just testing with your keyboard, and that's exactly what it sounds. So unplug your mouse, use your tab and your arrow keys and your space and enter, um, and just go through your page. Uh, what you want to look for? Um, can you see where your focus is? Um, so that's the focus indicators we talked about. Um, does the tab order make sense, or is it jumping all over the place? Um, can you actually tab to everything that you need to? Can you use all of the components? Sometimes things like date pickers can be a bit tricky, so just make sure that you can complete all the actions with the keyboard. Um, and does your focus move when it needs to, or does it just get dropped on the floor? Uh, so the other thing is a screen reader. That is a little bit more tricky, um, but uh, it's really, really valuable when you've got more advanced components or anything that's like interactive, like um, something that expands and collapses. You just want to be making sure that um, the state is being announced to the screen reader. Um, so there's two screen readers um, that I recommend testing with or pick one of them. Um, the first is VoiceOver. This is built into all Mac, OS, and iOS devices, so there's a good chance a lot of you already have this. It's just um, Command F5, and it'll turn it on, and you'll be really surprised. Um, and if you're on Windows, uh, you can download NVDA for free. Uh, this is the most widely popular um, screen reader in use. Uh, yeah, so give that a go after you've done your keyboard testing. Uh, and so, just going to start wrapping up. Um, just what have we? Just going to go over what we've said. Uh, so, using semantic HTML is really important. Uh, we want to link our labels with our form inputs. Uh, we want to update the page titles when we're doing the routing. We want to manage the keyboard focus and move it to new content. Uh, use the tooling that's available um, and just test your apps. So I feel like we're really lucky as developers that we have the potential to make a difference in people's lives. And so the code we write can give people more independence and make their lives easier. And I like to think that that's one of my superpowers. Uh, and I'd love for all of you to go out and try just some of the things we've talked about. Um, if you can implement just any of these, you'll be making a difference. Uh, and maybe it can be one of your superpowers too. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.